Good day, Jim. Thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. It's been 11 years since we did the last video back in 2008 when I began the series. But for our audience, could you please start off by introducing yourself? Uh, tell us where you live and work and what you do. Sure, this is Jim Hill. We're talking uh, in Los Altos, California. I'm the CEO of Organizational Performance Systems. Thank you. Can you talk to us a little bit about uh, where you grew up and where you went off to school and, and somehow get that to the point to where you joined the Marine Corps? Yeah, sure. The, uh, I was born in Sumter, South Carolina, and I was the son of a, I am the son of a Air Force officer who at the time uh, was a recent graduate of the Naval Academy. And so we did the requisite moves when I was little. And then we ended up, just like a lot of military guys, once they get out do their service, they go home. And that was the case for him, which was the St. Louis area. And then through my childhood, we lived between St. Louis and Chicago a couple of times, then we ended up in Columbus, Ohio when I was in 10th grade, uh, obviously the home of the Ohio State University, and that seemed like a good idea at the time. So I went to Ohio State, and about uh, halfway through, my dad said to me as a young, long-haired guy, you know, you probably need to take this summer off. And I said, really? You know, what? Why should I do that? And he said, because you're running out of summers. And pretty soon, every summer is going to be a work summer. So I headed to California. I hung out there for three or four months. I came back, and I'm going to say the second week I was at school, there were these Marines standing there in the hallway with their pamphlets and brochures. And I don't know what it was, but as I walked by those guys, I said to myself, first time I, by the way, I say this to a lot of people, it's the first time I had any self-realization. Uh, I said, if those guys are there tomorrow, I'm signing up. So the entire my, entirety of my thought process was that, and as it turned out, those guys were there tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and so I joined what is called the Platoon Leaders Class, which is a great Marine Corps program for uh, college students, and went to the Officer Candidate School in the summer, came back to Ohio State, graduated early just so I could join as a second lieutenant, and then the rest is history. So tell us a little bit about uh, your career as a Marine officer. What kinds of jobs did you have? What kinds of uh, posts were you uh, stationed at? Sure. I uh, went, Once I was commissioned, went to Quantico, I became a combat engineer. And that's a great job for people who like to be noisy. So a lot of blowing things up, a lot of mine warfare, uh, a lot of interaction with the infantry, the artillery, and the guys that really make it happen. And so I did. I was a platoon commander in a combat engineer battalion. I then went to Okinawa and uh, did another engineering job over there. Got detached to be an operations assistant, I'll call myself. Uh, for the purpose of this video. Uh, so as a lieutenant, you know, somebody in the ops office trying to help make things happen. And then uh, came back to the uh, United States, um, more engineering, went to the Marine Corps Institute, which is co-located with the oldest post of the Corps, Marine Barracks, Washington, D.C., or sometimes called, often called, 8th and I. Uh, headed back to the 1st Marine Division where I did all kinds of things from being a battalion executive officer to the training officer for the 1st Marine Division and a few other things. And then that uh, led to my career uh, ending at uh, 
um, Camp Pendleton uh, when I retired. And then I came up here to Silicon Valley and started working at Sun Microsystems. All right. Uh, I wanted to ask you about your studies at uh, the University of Southern California. I know that you uh, uh, work with uh, Dr. Richard E. Clark. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, you know what you took uh, that he was involved in and uh, what you learned from him? Yeah, sure. So again, I want to start that story by heading back to the Marine Corps because here I was at the first Marine Division headquarters working with uh, Colonel Tom Sheets, who had been my boss at the Marine Corps Institute uh, a few years before that. And the Marine Corps is small enough where you tend to run into the same guys over and over. But uh, it's probably about 1996 or so, and he comes into my office with this little trifold folder uh, or trifold pamphlet, and he said, Look at this. And it was a blurb for the Human Performance Technology Doctorate at the University of Southern California. And so I called the number and I spoke to somebody, and I'm sure it wasn't Dick Clark, but uh, I told him I was interested and I somehow got into that program. It certainly wasn't due to my academic record at Ohio State, but I, I got in and uh, it was just a wonderful program and, and not only you know did I work with Dick Clark but he was the chair of my research committee so you know I have a uh, a lot to I wheel a lot to uh, Dick for uh, the instruction and the guidance he gave me over those years. Mm -hmm. So you exited the Marine Corps. Did you have your PhD in hand, and then you went to Sun Microsystems? Is that it? No, I was. I was basically. I started that program about two years before I got out of the Marine Corps, which was one of the reasons uh, you know I needed to get out. Uh, uh, again, I was at the uh, retirement age at 20 years, and so uh, uh, the timing ended up being very good. All of my academics had been done at, at, by that point, or maybe I was a couple of courses uh, short. But the program works in cohorts, and there happened to be a northern cohort and a southern cohort. So I joined the northern cohort, and then for about three months, uh, traveled back to Southern California every other week or so. But then I was in my dissertation period, and that was another couple of years and so I really I think I probably got my doctorate in 2000 okay. who was actually awarded so talk to us a little bit about the the work you did then in the civilian sector after getting out of the Marine Corps yeah my son career was a little bit like my academic career and a little bit like my Marine Corps career people really didn't know what to do with me and in fact when I was being hired at Sun, uh, the hiring director said, you know, we don't know what we're going to do with you, but we're going to do something with you. And I said, okay. Uh, and I was used to hearing that. So I came up here the day after I retired. I didn't know you were supposed to take time off. But uh, I showed up, and the first thing they did with me was put me at Sun U which was the corporate university and what they asked me to do was fine tune or start depending upon the program a couple of uh, executive development programs uh, which we did and which were pretty phenomenal and not because of the design or what I did but we really had great uh, uh, guest speakers uh, we had great instructors from outside. Sun. It, it, it was pretty. It was great, and uh, we we did the best we could, which was substantial uh, in shaping directors through VPs, and it, it, it was a it was a good time. But I did not want to be in the corporate university, and I found that out pretty quickly. 
I liked what I was doing. I thought we were helping shape people that were already outstanding leaders. But I needed to do something closer to the line. And one day I got a phone call. And, you know, back then it was pretty cool when you could see the name of the caller on your phone. Now everybody can do it. But back then it was, you know, monumental. And there was a name on the phone that I didn't know, picked it up, and this lady said to me, you don't know me, but it's time for you to move. And I said, is that a fact? Where would I be moving to? She said, well, you need to talk to this guy named Bob McRitchie. And at the time, Bob was the VP of Asia Pac Sales and definitely seen as an up-and-comer, uh, one of the top leaders at Sun, who ended up being the head of the global sales force. But Bob McRitchie was a real visionary. And I went over to see him, and not only was a visionary, but he was also intimidating. And so we sat down at a table, and he said, so what's your story? I don't know, I'm just here because somebody said it was a good idea for us to meet. And his question to me was, why is it that when I want to improve the performance of the the Asia-Pac sales force, everybody wants to train everyone? And I said, I don't know. And he said, so what would you do? And I said, well, I wouldn't train them unless they're new. And he said, well, what would you do? And I said, I'd tell them what I want them to do. I'd give them the tools to do it, and I'd give them incentives to make it happen. And he said, when you coming over? <laughs> and uh, I said, when do you want me? He said, two weeks from now. And two weeks later, to the day, I was sitting in the office next to his. And I had actually drawn for him, this is maybe interesting to the people who watch these videos, I would actually drawn for him on a little piece of paper the behavior engineering model. And when I say I drew it small, I mean I drew it about that big. Mm -hmm. In the corner of a piece of paper. And he saw that, and he looked at it for a minute, and he said, what do you call this? And I said... I don't know, what do you want to call it? Because if you call it the behavior engineering model, if you start doing what we do, um, you turn off everybody. And I said, what do you want to call it? And he said, we're going to call that the Asia PAC model for sales performance. And he tore the corner of that piece of paper up and he stuck it in his pocket. So, four months later, by the way, the rest of the story is four months later, he came to me and says, hey, listen, I got to go. He was being promoted to run what was then another innovative part of Sun called eSun, our first uh, foray into e-sales, which again, we're just around, 90, there's around 2000, I'll say. This was all new. eBay was hot. And, you know, we were trying to figure out a bunch of different things. And if you get, if you want, we'll get to that. But um, he said, I can't move you with me now, but give me a couple of months. And a couple of months later, I went over there, and he said, you know that model? And I said, yeah. And he said, we're going to call that Sun's model for e-sales performance. And then he became, when, once he became the, uh, uh, or sorry, once I became the head of uh, performance improvement for the global sales force, we called it Sun's model for global sales performance. So that model saw a lot of iterations, but it was all because we called it what the customers wanted to call mm-hmm. it. Excellent. Excellent story. That was a, that was a great uh, time of uh, you know, my developmental life. Mm-hmm. And I remember you talking, uh, telling me some stories about these things, and that's why I wanted to capture this. So, what else did you do then at Sun before you decided to leave and start your own firm? Can you take us through uh, that progression? Sure. When I was uh, asked to lead the sales performance arm of the global of the global sales force, 
I looked around and we had something like 350 people, maybe 300 people around the world doing sales training. So, you know, the Asia Pac guys would have their thing, the uh, uh, East Coast guys would have their thing. It, 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 was, it was a mess. And so people were just getting bombarded with more training, so they say. Um, and so I put a proposal together that suggested we could do it with about 40 people. Of course, you know, that doesn't bode well for 260 people. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter was we needed to be a performance organization, not a training organization. You don't get trained by what you know. You get, you get, or you get paid for what you do in a sales business. And uh, so it was important to focus on that. So I, you know, regrettably, uh, on, on one hand, but positively on the other, uh, net that organization down and created the philosophy for the global sales uh, performance organization. And now this is retrospective. Uh, the guy who does the bloodletting probably isn't going to be the guy who's going to sustain the organization. That's probably two different personalities. And so I was finding out that I was really good at designing these things and making them happen, but I'm probably not the sustainment guy. And so I did that. They brought in another person to uh, sustain it. And then I needed to do something. And so this goes back to the whole notion of e-sales. And I became the, the first guy at Sun to sell enterprise servers via eBay. And so we're talking about a million and a half dollar machines. And it was incredibly successful. The We sold 60 in about it went out about in one quarter, which was unheard of, and it really helped Sun at a time Sun needed some help. We then tried it with a few blades, and you know, and I don't really ever get the early adopter thing as it relates to technology. I don't know why somebody would stand it in front of Best Buy overnight to get a phone when. A month later you can get it you know online or wherever but there are people that do that and so we sold a bunch of blades uh, via eBay and uh, that was fantastic opportunity uh, that was very good for me and it gave at that time I had just started thinking about starting this company which we were going to call Proofpoint Systems and so that actually gave me the funding I needed to start the company. And uh, about six months later, then uh, I departed some. So tell us a little bit about uh, Proofpoint and how that uh, uh, transitioned into OPS, Organizational Performance sure. Systems. Yeah. The, uh, so when I was at Sun, I got exposed to a lot of consultants who were there presumably to help us with big issues. And, you know, I was using my doctoral experience to guide a lot of my professional decisions. And we were working on a telecommunications issue at one point, and it was you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in play. And we needed that part of the business to be better. And we had a big time consultancy in there. And they had come in at one point and they had, you know, kind of thrown me a list of 80 executives that they needed to talk to. And I, you know, I was like, well, go figure out how to talk to them. I'm, I'm not your scheduler. Uh, and, you know, months go by and they came in with this big presentation to the core executive team and it was recommendation after recommendation with these PowerPoint slides or whatever we were using back then and I said well what three things should we do first we're talking about performance here 
and well, it depends on your culture, and it depends on. And I, I was thinking to myself, that's just not true. And it was at that moment that I said, we have to do something about this. And so, the beginning of proof point systems was the idea that a technology could do a better job of diagnosing or guiding people through the diagnostic process than humans can. And no matter how many consultants you put on a project, pick any number you want, that compendium or of people is not ever going to be smarter than a software application that basically has a global uh, access. And so we built a expert system that asks you questions and if you ask the, answer the questions right, which is what a consultant's going to be doing when they're sitting in front of you just like this or live, and if you can answer those questions, then it accessed a database of 9.35 times 10 to the 49th power of organizational performance issues, likely solutions, and organizational complexity. And that was our first product. The Navy happened to like that. Uh, they liked the idea of it. And so for a little more than two years, we worked with uh, the Navy on a few issues. That led to some other gigantic analyses, uh, global analysis of uh, needs in the defense security cooperation business, meaning, uh, you know, that's the people that sell things to foreign government. It's about a $50 billion part of uh, DOD and State Department combined. Uh, a global maritime analysis a global aviation security analysis, I mean some really big issues and where consultants would take months or maybe a year or more to do that kind of analysis. In the application, uh, people were finding that they could do the actual analysis in about two weeks. And that was involving thousands of people in, you know, in some cases over a hundred countries. So that was what we ended up doing, and now you know we've got a number of uh, products that deal with a number of uh, different lines of business. So this was at Proofpoint Systems. When did it become OPS? What's the story of that transition? Uh, changing a company name is my experience. Somebody might have a different one, but changing a company name is not that easy. I mean, there's a you, one you're invested in whatever you call this thing when you first started. But as it turned out, I want to call this thing proofpoint.com. Uh, when we got uh, as, when I went to get the name, another company, which was selling security devices, had snagged the name like six months before. So that's how we became Proofpoint Systems. That's how we became proofpoint.net. For some reason, they didn't pick up the .net idea. But I had seen this notion of proof points in Sun when the engineers are talking in particular. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it was a great concept for, for performance people. And so we called it proof point. But proof point can be a little obscure. And so about four years ago, I'll say, uh, I started thinking about better names. And organizational performance systems seems to, one, say something before you have to describe it. And it's a little bit more concise. And the acronym OPS, which is the way we call it, it makes a lot of sense because there's sales ops, there's manufacturing ops, there's, you go down the list, but people know what ops are. Mm -hmm. And so we made the, ch it took me two years to pull the trigger on it. And uh, so here we are today. So tell me a little bit more about the other products and services. You have this uh, diagnostic tool. What else, uh, what other products and services do you have? Well, so we had this app, uh, which was really great. 
and it had everything. I mean, you know, you start with the strategic plan. You know, why am I doing this thing? Well, it must align to some goals. And then it had measurement at the end. I mean, it's not just what business metric am I trying to improve. Uh, it's the compendi- It's the front-to-end thinking process. Mm-hmm. And so when I was taking this application around to other parts of the government, uh, one person in particular, uh, a one-star general, Air Force guy, looks at this app. He goes, that's really cool. He goes, but I don't want it. <laughs> I said, well, that's what I got. He goes, can you just give me the front side of it? And I said, well, what do you think the front side is? He says, that's strategic planning piece. Can you give me that? And I said, well, there's a lot of strategic planning tools out here. And this is a kind of an important conversation for people who, you know, have a lot of tools or apps or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. But why do you want it? He goes, because if I ever need it, it links to those other things. So I just have one platform. And I go, okay, that's good. And so we started, we peeled that piece off, and now we had the strategic planning now. And then about four months later, he came to me, and he says, well, look, if I got the goals, can I put in measurements and then you know measure my executive team? And so now we're talking about SESers, right, senior executive service people, mm-hmm. in EOD in this case. And I said, don't you have one of those? And he goes, yeah, but it's not any good. Um, I, want to, I want you to create this performance management app. So now you'll have the goals, you'll have what I plan to do, and then you'll have the measurement. I said, okay, I'll do that. And we actually created, and it was, I'm sure we were the first ones to do this, uh, we created a tool that was point and click, and if you pointed to certain uh, widgets, it actually built in a coherent way the performance statement that you were trying, the goal that you were trying to achieve was really good. Uh, So we built that, and so that's DOD and to some degree uh, the private sector, and by private sector I mean Fortune 2000. If you're smaller than that and you need an app like the ones we have, you know, maybe you've got other problems, right? Uh, th- these are big company applications. Mm-hmm. And the beauty of them is, of course, beyond streamlining the work is you keep the data uh, as opposed to getting it in some kind of dead folder from a consultant. Uh, so we did that, and then uh, my brother, who was in the healthcare business, he's the COO of a uh, major hospital, He came to me and said, well, you're helping these other people. Why can't you help me? (laughs) And that was about five years ago. And so we built a number of really sleek little tools that would help uh, hospitals get better. A nurse engagement app, which, as it turns out, is helping reduce nurse turnover, unplanned nurse turnover, by... 50 or 60 percent, and uh, meaning, you know, net from if it's 17 or 18 percent, and we're getting them down to eight or nine percent. And the important part about that is that if you have an average hospital, one percent turnover is about 350 thou. So eight percent turnover is a couple million dollars, and these places operate on two to three percent margin. So that's a big help to a hospital. Uh, We have some safety uh, applications. We have a number of things that are uh, web-enabled tools or um, that are accessible via mobile device that help people do various surveys and audits. But most recently, so that's on the acute care side. And then on the post-acute care side, this is really hot, uh, we have an infection control an antibiotic stewardship application that is just getting ready to pop. Uh, we've had a, it's taken us a couple of years to get it good over the course of the last four months. It's really blowing up, but this application is cutting infections in elder care or long-term care environments by 50 percent, and it's also reducing the associated headcount. And again, that's a place that they have low margins even though it costs a lot, 
for us to have a loved one in these places. Um, it's very exp those are very expensive operations. And so uh, uh, if we can help them be a little bit more efficient as opposed to doing administrative stuff, they can spend more time doing care. And uh, uh, so we're real happy with that. So basically three product lines, uh, big company or uh, federal state stuff, uh, the acute care applications and uh, the post-acute care. So the software applications that you have, they're reducing administrative burden and, and then allowing that, that time savings to be used for care or other purposes? Is that the secret uh, for what you're doing? Well, that's part of the secret. The other secret is it's giving people data. Um, you know, sometimes we knock our own profession. And the fact of the matter is there's almost no data out there regarding day-to-day -day transactions. And that's not just Jim Hill saying that. You know, J.P. Morgan said that in a, a tech briefing in 2016. It just isn't out there. People do this stuff on dead forms. They do it on PowerPoint. They put it in Excel. They've got 15 versions of Excel. It doesn't go anywhere. And so by creating these applications, particularly applications that talk to one another, um, not only are you solving an immediate issue, which is you know some element of what's called workflow, some element of timely decision making, but you're creating a way to see how am I doing over time. I mean, it really doesn't help you if you want to lose weight. It doesn't help you to uh, weigh yourself once a year. Mm -hmm. And now you can see in real time, almost, let's just use that infection control app as an example. Yes. You can watch uh, on a floor plan of a facility, infections kind of move around in a, a hallway. And why would you wait until it's a problem if you can nip those things in the bud uh, quicker? Not only you make people healthier, you're going to save yourself a lot of money, and uh, you're going to increase your. There's a reputational aspect as well. So excellent. Uh, it's, but it's all the data. Thank you. I, I I've been interested in the, those kinds of specifics here for a number of years as I've, I've tried to follow you and your career in this uh, organization that you started. Let me take you a look back a little bit now to some of your first exposures to human performance technology. Obviously, that was at USC. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the, the things, the people and things that influenced you, such as uh, uh, authors or consultants or professors and uh, books and articles as a way to point to our audience things that they may want to pursue? Sure. So I want to just go back a little farther than Sun. I was actually first exposed to the notion of HPT when I first arrived at the Marine Corps Institute. Okay. Um, now, a little background, Marine Corps Institutes at the time was the world's largest distance education organization by, in terms of enrollments. And I was running that, the largest part of the Marine Corps Institute. And I worked with a gentleman named Fred, Rod, uh, Fred Roberts. And Mr. Roberts was way ahead of the Marine Corps times. Uh, and he was my civilian sidekick, my counterpart. Uh, but he was fully invested in this thing called HPT. And he said to me, you need to learn about this because this was the philosophy he was trying to incorporate in these uh, fairly static training materials. So. I started, I read things that Fred suggested I read. He was a big follower at the time of Dean Spitzer. And as it turns out, Dean ended up doing a couple of uh, really cool projects with Proofpoint when we were doing some global analyses. So it took, you know, whatever, 20 something years for that relationship to happen. Uh, but what Fred did for me, and I didn't realize he was doing it to me, but about, I, I guess I'd been at the uh, Marine Corps Institute for about a year. He said, you know, you ought to present at 
a local cha chapter, and that was the Potomac chapter of ISPI or then NSPI. So I uh, I did that, and that's when I met Claire Carey for the first time, who I thought was a super professional. And so I did this presentation. I prepared for this presentation, and going into it, Fred said, "Listen." when you do this there's going to be a bunch of guys sitting in the back of the room and they're going to call you out on your data so have your answers at the ready and ISP I didn't really do that anymore a little bit more clubby but the softer uh, but sure enough I do this presentation I don't even know what it was on but I get done and some Buddy says, oh, what are your data related to? And I had done, you know, thanks to Fred, I didn't get caught flat-footed. And I gave my answer, and two or three people in the room went, good, all right. And so uh, that turned out all right. Then Fred had me present at the national conference, and I got an opportunity to do that. But the Marine Corps Institute was part of the Armed Forces chapter, and the Armed Forces chapter, I don't know how it is now, but it used to be really rocking. And we would have an annual conference down in Williamsburg, and all the, it was, you know, we're doing this on uh, next to no money. And all of the big guys, big ISPI folks, I shouldn't just call them guys because we'll get to some names in a minute, would come and spend a half a day each over three days with us. So, Roger Kaufman, Joe Harless, Tiagi, Sam Schmickler, who I have high regard for, Lynn Carney, uh, these folks would come in and really spend time with us. And so that's how we were getting smart about human performance technology. And then, you know, the more I spent, uh, I had decided at that point you know how you kind of get into these things and you go, this is what I'm going to do? I was at the Marine Corps. This was probably about 1990 now, and uh, uh, that's what I had recognized. This is what this is going to be my profession. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I know I'm going to do something there. So then the USC part, Harold Stolovich, Dennis Hosovar, uh, Toby Tettenbaum, uh, Dick, who we've already discussed, and uh, many others uh, were instrumental in shaping the monster I've become. <laughs> <laughs> well, shift gears with me a little bit here. So you became the conference chairperson for the Long Beach Conference. We discussed this just a little <laughs> bit before we started the, this video. Uh, how did you, uh, what's the backstory? How did you uh, get roped into doing that? Well, you know, so I was, a lot of people, let, let's start with how people are members of ISBI. A lot of people call themselves professionals. And they remain professionals as long as their organizations pay for it. Uh, so when I was at the Marine Corps Institute, it was great because you'd go to these conferences and people would pay, you know, the government would pay your way. But once you leave the Marine Corps Institute, which you're going to do, you can't go to the first Marine Division and say, hey, would you send me to an organizational performance conference? You, you wouldn't even think about it. And so that's on you. And if you want to be a professional, this is going to be your field, then you better invest in it. And I had decided that that's what I was going to do. Um, and again, I, you know, I, we'll get to the conference in a minute, but there was one point, and then I, this is going to be out of sequence, but I, stick, I stuck with this because it was, you know, everybody talks about your professional home. Well, this became it. And that's how I met guys like you and Roger Addison and Carol Haig and you know that phenomenal group of Bay, as it turns out Bay Area people uh, but the I, I got sent over to Somalia at one point in the Marine Corps 
and I got back in April and I mean I was all I was worn out uh, and then I, I was probably back a day and I remembered that the ISPI conference was going to go on in Dallas so I said to my wife I mean one day I was back I said hey I'm going to go to Dallas and go to this con conference uh, my time zones were all messed up 24 hours after leaving Somalia I was in the Dallas conference and I was I, I would say I was probably pretty well wired uh, but I mean that's the commitment that I had to ISPI at the time so the, the bottom line story was I showed a lot of interest in ISPI as a military officer folks Came, they bent over backwards to include me in committees, and I helped a couple of years uh, look at conference proposals, and that all led to Carol Haig suggesting that I become the conference chair. And so, you know, when people ask you to do something, the best answer is yes. And it's an opportunity that you don't want to pass up and so I uh, said yes and had a phenomenal group of people to work with uh, you know in terms of track chairs and you know the way we did it back then again I don't know how they do it now but uh, uh, it turned out really tremendously and I think that year you know th this will be it's not meant to, you know, disparage anything that's going on now. But I, we probably had 1,900, wouldn't you yes, think, people right. uh, at a conference like that, and it really helped out uh, financially for Ohio State or for uh, uh, for ISPI. For so, uh, it was uh, it, it was a great event and a great venue, and you know. It, it was a good experience, and that led to us getting together. You know, about a year or two later on the board. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember at the end of the conference, uh, you had uh, parting words, I guess, for people at the conference, and uh, I don't know how it came to this, but uh, people were asking you. So, you know, you're going to get out of the Marine Corps, I guess, at the time, and the big question is, what are you going to do about your hair? Yeah. Carol, hey. That's Carol's question. <laughs> so that, uh, but you know what? Else? That was memorable. Yeah. It, not only was memorable, it was important. The when you're going into a new environment, <clears throat> you really you, look. Let's just use that. Let's just play with the behavior engineering model again. Right? Uh, uh, Sun's model for sales yes. performance. Uh, you know, expectations and feedback, right? What are you, information, what are you going to do? What are you thinking about up here in the upper left? And, you know, if somebody doesn't help you with that, you could, you can unknowingly not fit in. And so you, you start thinking about stuff like, you know, what am I, what is my hair going to look like? Uh, uh, you know, what am I going to wear? Uh, all of those things are a part of a different uniform mm -hmm. and you know people are kidding themselves if they don't think there are uniforms in different parts of an organization and so that was it was really helpful there's an article out there in the ISPI archive somewhere called my hair mm -hmm. I just I just don't know where it is <coughs> excuse me I'm sure we can find it um, so yeah so a couple of years after that, uh, you got elected to the board of directors. I got elected to the board of directors at the same time. We served together on the board under uh, uh, Dale Brethauer and then John Swinney. Um, and we had an interesting conversation at uh, uh, John Swinney's uh, conference. And we, we I don't think we flipped a coin. I think we just agreed that we both wanted to run for president we shouldn't run against each other, so we, you went first and, and ran and won, and I ran the next year and won, but 
one of the interesting things about that was that uh, I was already thinking about a 1983 article of Gary Rumler, which was all about how to define human performance technology. And his, uh, I'll paraphrase it and said, he, di he didn't think it was appropriate to try to do that with a couple of paragraphs, but he wanted to define human per performance technology in terms of the technology domains. That was the phrase that he used so that there could be uh, in today's language, there could be Lean and Six Sigma kind of people doing process uh, kind of work. There's instructional design. There's people working on motivation and such. And there, anyway, so he had suggested uh, a, a series of these uh, professional technology domains. And I was thinking at the time that ISPI was suffering from um, a lack of solid marketing to define their value proposition, what it was all about what's in the box of HBT and what's not. And you agree that if if I would go second in uh, this election process, that you would support me, and you did, um, along with Judy Hale, who was the president in between John Swinney and yourself, uh, to allow us to ta tackle that issue with a society-wide uh, initiative. Um, now, what's retained out of all of that effort that came out of that uh, in uh, clarifying HPT, as it soon came to be called, was it named the tracks of the conference. And I think that that's pretty much what all it does today. Um, so I wanted to ask you some questions about ISPI because I know that you have some strong feelings. Uh, it's your professional home as it is mine. Um, we would like it to not just survive, but to thrive. And so I have a, a couple of questions here for you. Um, if you were the czar of ISPI, what kinds of short-term and medium-term changes would you implement? What, what would you do to address to help the organization be, become stronger? Well, I think the first thing you have to do is focus on performance. Uh, right now, and, and right now is, like it was 30 years ago maybe there's still a heavy lean toward training and there's hardly any impact you can make when you're a training person you can have a temporary impact but you know, to be enduring is very unlikely and, and it's unlikely because there's a lot of training stuff that goes on in corporations that probably shouldn't happen at all. Uh, somebody told me at one point there are two types of people. And I've changed that to there's three types of people in organizations. People who make stuff, people who sell stuff, and people who count the money. If you're not one of those people, you're overhead. And ISPI has to be careful about being an overhead organization. So, if I were going to do anything, the first thing I would do is focus on those three kinds of people. More generally, I would go after leaders of organizations as opposed to individual contributors. Individual contributors have their role they're essential to what we do in a company. But at the end of the day, leaders are gonna make it happen. And if leaders don't know about us, it, ISPI, then there is no chance that ISPI or ISPI thinking is going to become a part of that leader's lexicon, uh, toolkit, or whatever. So focus on three kinds of people, lessen the influence of training, and uh, uh, go after uh, senior leaders. Let me ask you about uh, something that I think you kind of sponsored or supported, and you brought together, and I forget what you called it, but it was a panel of business leaders that you brought into the conference uh, for a number of years running and had them have a conversation in front of the audience. And can you talk to us a little bit about that and give me a name for it? I can't, uh, it's just slipped my mind. Sure. Sure. Um, 
at the time we were going, uh, we were having some, uh, ISPI was having some panel discussions, but most of the panelists were ISPI people, and somehow I had found myself on that committee. Maybe it was an, I maybe I was an advisor or something like that, or I, I don't know how it happened, but I was on it, and I'm thinking, why are we talking to ourselves? Uh, there's a sure way to not learn anything. And so, so somebody asked, well, what would you do? And I said, well, let's go get executives that we want to be our clients and see if they'll come talk to us. And so we called that, everybody thought it was an okay idea, and we called that executive buzz. And the first folks that we had, you know, we just drew from my client list, and we had an uh, undersecretary from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. We had a chief nurse from a huge hospital in Cincinnati. Uh, we had a couple other great folks on the team, uh, on the panel. And uh, they got people thinking. And so we did that for a couple of years, and then I passed the torch on that to uh, a gentleman named Mike Blonick from up in uh, Detroit. And he he did a great job with it for a couple of years. I don't know what the state of that is now, but uh, not only did you get the panel out of it, but we got a couple of articles written by the panelists. Uh, uh, I know that a number of ISPI folks ended up uh, working with or at least conversing with some of the uh, panelists. So uh, it, it, it turned into a halfway decent event. But it's pretty tough to get those executives to come. And so you have to be able to sell ISPI really well. And so ISPI has to, any organization, but ISPI in this particular case, has to really put its best foot forward in order to look like something. Uh, because uh, people want to come knowing that they're talking to forward-leaning people. Mm -hmm. So there's a sales pitch involved. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, let me shift gears here before we wrap up. I'm hoping that you have some stories to tell about uh, some of the people in the society or outside of the society who have had an impact with you. Maybe you have a funny story to tell or a serious story to tell. Um, can I pin you down here? Can you uh, can you share something? Because uh, you you interacted with a lot of the so-called gurus in, in the movement. Um, anything come to mind? I don't know. Well, first, you know, I, I wanted to say this when we first started, and I, you know, I don't know if anybody ever gets to the end of these videos, but uh, the uh, one of the things I miss about me and you is our annual Sambucas. Yes. And we got to figure out a way to do that. There are so many fun stories for me from ISPI, not only the uh, Armed Forces chapter events, which were, besides being educational, they were rip-roaring, they, they were on the edge. <laughs> and uh, we had a blast in those things, and so, you know, if you get to uh, Margot Murray's and uh, some of the other folks that you know hung around for the whole conference. Uh, those were always great times. Uh, I don't know if there's any one story, but I will tell you that my experience with ISPI, if you ask somebody to do something, and if you committed, they would commit right back. And so where there might be some kind of hierarchy of experience or uh, uh, the perception of being, you know, popular in the field or whatever it is. Nobody cares about that stuff at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe Harless might have. Um, he might. He might have said, "I'm not coming to your uh, Armed Forces chapter event. I can't do it. You know, I'm making too much money down here." But at the end of the day, he was just pushing you. And you know what? He ch he showed up. Mm -hmm. And so. Uh, 
I would just say that uh, I don't know if I have any funny ones. I've had plenty of opportunities to be funny and to have joke and opportunities at ISPI with the Dr. Jimmy stuff and uh, Mr. Rogers stuff and you know whatever else we did that was just fun. But uh, ISPI is also a chance to kind of let your guard down a little bit. And in those moments that are those unstructured moments, those are the times where you really find out, one, is this a profession for you and, you know, what am I learning today? And so uh, I would just say that uh, I've had more good times at ISP. I've never had a bad time at ISP, mm -hmm. but uh, um, the good times can really be uh, foundational as it relates to your professional core. I agree. Thank you for that. As a final wrap here, what uh, kind of guidance or words of wisdom would you have for people who are entering the profession? Don't add and performance improvement to the end of your job title uh, would be my first recommendation. Two, get off paper and use technology to drive your job because sooner or later either you or your job is not going to be there anymore and the data need to be retained. If you retain them then you've got a professional portfolio. If your company retains it, it has the you know what amounts to an organizational health record. Uh, but use technology and the third recommendation I would have is find places where you can grow and uh, if you can do that you'll be a pro uh, I know I said I was going to end at three but the fourth one I would say is find a way to be one of those three people that we talked about earlier uh, and just use performance technology to be a leader because at the end of the day those are the guys those are the folks that are going to drive an organization and the people who are and performance improvements um, they're probably temporary in any organization Jim, again, thank you so much for uh, spending this time with me and doing this interview. Um, I wish you good luck in the future. I'll be paying attention, and we'll have to get together for that Sambuca at some future point. But thanks, and have a great day. Thank you, Guy. I've really enjoyed the time today.